first what I'd like to do is um, just sort of provide a little bit of an overview of uh, the work that I've been doing most recently. And then I want to uh, kind of give an, uh, just a brief overview of Afghan history, very brief. It's incredibly complicated, just so we're a little bit on the same page. And then I'll talk about what I call these the kind of geopolitics of feminisms. But I want to be clear that feminism, I'm using that as a technical term, because it's not a term that's actually commonly used that much in Afghanistan because of it being um, so sullied in various ways. Sort of similar to the US, where it's kind of the F word, not exactly a common uh, term of acceptance. And, and that's also true in Afghanistan. So I, I, I'm using it sort of more in an academic technical sense. So um, as, <clears throat> as was mentioned, I co-authored a book with Rachel Lair. And I also like to give a shout out to her. She's a, a linguist by training who I've worked with for several years. Um, like many co uh, collaborators, we met at a conference and we started working together in and outside of Afghanistan and we continue to do that to this day. So what I want to do is, with the history is sort of take us back to the early uh, 20th century and this is Queen Soraya who was the wife of King Amanullah or Amir Amanullah who was considered one of the sort of modernists in Afghanistan and, and his modernization efforts in some ways being pattern after what was happening in Turkey. And, and this image of her um, is a very popular image, but also this and similar images of her unveiled with her arm showing and her face showing was, were also used uh, in Afghanistan to try and discredit Amanullah from power. So, and the reason I'm situating this is because what I want to really focus on today is how women, and Afghan women in particular, have become uh, have become the kind of the focus of various geopolitical influences. So, so the, the nationalization of women and the internationalization of Afghan women have uh, been used to serve the geopolitical and the powerful desires of, of, of various groups, whether they were nationalists in Afghanistan or internationalists looking to either extend territory in the case of the Soviets or having a political economic, and economic influence in Afghanistan if we look at the US. So, so this is just a reminder that this is an old history. This is not new that women have been used in these geopolitical ways. This has existed for some time. And then when we look at uh, the mid uh, 20th century or early to mid 20th century, you have King Zaire Shah and Queen Umrayah who uh, were you know, the leaders, and she was, she was uh, considered to be very focused on women's rights and, and women's education. And then they were, they were rulers of the monarchy into 73, and then Mohammed Dayoud basically took power in a, in a, a bloodless coup, coup against the king when he was uh, outside of the country. And they were also cousins, so he was also part of the monarchy. So it's a little complicated. Anyway, we all have complicated families, I'm sure. So, um, so all of these different groups claim to save women, including the U.S. <laughs> in 2001. So, so what we have looked at through both kind of this historical analysis, but also a ge geographic and more social science analysis, is trying to understand the interrelationship between these different kinds of saving, and then also how um, how women's rights has had, has many meanings and configurations and women themselves have been multiply influenced and and there's not um, if you if you learn nothing else from my talk today is is the the category afghan woman is meaningless right there is no afghan woman there is even afghan women is a false category because it's so diverse and it's so complicated and it doesn't just rely on ethnic lines it it has so many more complications that have to do with Location again, who your family is, what what um, your religious beliefs, your your um, socioeconomic status, um, your connection to various forms of power, and 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 location. I mean, and physical geography also has a huge um, influence here as well. So so going back to this being such a big deal in the U.S. So this is Carolyn Maloney, Democrat uh, representative from New York, and she actually wore a burqa on the House floor in October of 2001 in order to call for the US military to uh, take women's issues um, under, you know, sort of under advisement. And, and this was done in, by, by various famous 
women in the US, Eve Ensler was really involved, uh, Oprah Winfrey famously unveiled an Afghan woman at a, at a charity event in Madison Square Garden with a bunch of other famous women. And uh, anyway, so, so, so the burqa became this kind of symbol, it really sort of all the oppression that women experienced under the Taliban was really reduced to this one garment. And the other thing I want to make clear, too, is that the Taliban was a hard time for men, too. <laughs> so yes, women, women were, were barred from work. They were barred from seeking um, medical services from male doctor. I mean, some really horrible things. But men also experienced a tremendous amount of abuse. I mean, when we look at all of the, the human rights abuses, which included public floggings, public amp amputations, and hangings, and, and being shot to death in the Kabul uh, football stadium and other places, the majority of those victims were men. So, so very, a very small number of them were women compared to, relative to the amount of men that were, were killed and abused. However, what we hear about in the US is mainly focuses on women because it was geopolitically expedient for us to do that in the US, okay? And to, and to also try to rewrite the history of the US supporting those same, same and similar groups in Afghanistan during the 1980s. I also want to, <laughs> because the, the chadri or burqa be, has become such a symbol and really um, over time in the US, and we also did a, a historical analysis of how the, the, the burqa, as it's known in the US, became so demonized. And it really started well before 9-11, but, um, but what we often don't think about is it's, it's kind of historical position in Afghanistan. It actually comes from Mughal India, and I have this, this is a, an image from um, the, the Amber Fort uh, in India, which is from the Mughal Empire, just to, give you, just to show you this kind of similarities in, in architecture, if you will, what we call the architecture of the burqa, because it, it basically allows a woman to have mobility in public space while preserving the sanctity of the protections expected at home. So, so it actually allows for mobility, even though it gets associated with immobility and with silence. Believe me, if you're ever in a marketplace in Afghanistan with a bunch of women in burqas, they are not silent. Okay, they haggle with the best of them. It, 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 it allows for voice. And, uh, and in fact, with a friend of mine, we were working on a paper right now that's kind of looking at the, at the different ways in, in which sight matters, right? So, so in, in many ways, uh, women actually have the ability to see without being seen, right? And so, so if we just flip that around, we might think of it in different ways as, as them maybe having more, more ability or more power in some ways, um, where, where men don't necessarily have that ability. And men are also expected to divert their eyes when they see women. Like there is, there is, a, there is a particular form of behavior and dress for men that is expected also in Afghanistan. And I think sometimes we forget that because we're focusing so much on, on women and what they have to wear in that. It's not like men also aren't, um, aren't expected to dress in certain ways. And in fact, many of our interviews with Afghan men talked about the, the difficulties they experienced feeling like they had to dress Western in order to access income or access um, funds from Western donors after uh, the U.S.-led invasion and international aid effort in Afghanistan, that they, that they had to shave their beards. You know, they, they felt like they had to change their style in order to meet a particular Western idea of what a man should look like, right? Public sort of media focus on women in Afghanistan. So you had this uh, Sharbat Gula who was photographed as a child in 1984 without her permission, and then later National Geographic found her. This was a, a Freedom Poster Award winner in 2001, or two, sorry, the 2003 Miss, Miss Earth pageant, which had a Miss Afghanistan who actually lived in California and competed in the Miss, Inter Miss America International Division in order to participate. You had the fetishization of the burqa in a sexualized way. There's many other examples of this that I won't share with you, because they're really in, bleh. And uh, this was a <laughs> little Kim, who was a female rapper, who wore that on the cover of One World Magazine, which actually ended up being very controversial. And then in 2010, this image of Aisha, who was actually abused by her husband in Afghanistan. However, it was represented mostly in the US as this being a, a Taliban act, even though the Taliban wasn't necessarily responsible for that particular act. 
but it was a, another way of saying why we needed to be in Afghanistan, even though that happened while the US was in Afghanistan. Oh, also, this is a, a Beauty Without Borders campaign that led to a book called, that was a bestseller in the US called The Beauty School of Kabul. And so there was this attempt to sort of retrain Afghan women how to, how to look Western and how to be beautiful in a way that met um, Western desires and Western aesthetics about beauty and, and um, the public representation of the body. So leftist, Islamic, capitalist, and each of these categories have interrelating connections and significant departures from each other. And each provide various opportunities for women's organizing, women's rights, and, and women's participation in Afghan politics, economics, and society. While these remain diverse, finding the common ground and connections among these disparate social, economic, and political philosophy, philosophies is where our research is focused and where women's rights can flourish. Thank you.